the young lions of Tarshish. One of the main ideas in Prophecy Workshop is that, prophetically speaking, Great Britain is Tarshish, and her ex-colonies are the cubs of Tarshish. For more on this, you can look up the webpage, Great Britain is Tarshish. However, this is not my own idea. I first heard about it in the 1990s through the Bible teaching of a man called Roger Price. Since then, I have found a book on the subject written by an Australian pastor in the 1940s. Now I have found that the idea goes back at least to the 17th century. In other words, ever since English-speaking people have had access to a Bible that they can read, the idea of England or Great Britain being Tarshish has been prevalent. I want to look at some of the individual Tarshish nations, but first I would like to examine the history of the idea to show that it is not some new theory, but it is actually something that has been around for a long time. Prior to the publication of the authorised version, also known as the King James Version, in 1611, there were very few Bibles available to read in English. It was only in the 17th century that the Bible became widely read by ordinary people. This chart actually shows 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9. Nine English Bibles prior to the King James. Probably the best of them was the Geneva Bible. When people did start reading the Bible, they became aware of such things as the millennial reign of Christ and the prophecies relating to the last days. People started to realise that the Bible is not just a history book, but it's a story about God's plan for the world and about our future. The return of the Jews to their own land is clearly prophesied in the Bible. This became something that was picked up on in the 17th century England. There was an explosion in religious discussion. At the time, as people finally had access to the scriptures, in 1621, Sir Henry Finch published a book entitled The World's Great Restoration, or The Calling of the Jews. He clearly stated that the promises of God to Israel were not figurative or allegorical, but literal, and the Jews would have a literal return to their own land. Here is an extract from Sir Henry Finch's book, The World's Great Restoration. And it says, where Israel, Judah, Zion, and Jerusalem are named in the Bible, the Holy Ghost meant not the spiritual Israel or the church of God collected of the Gentiles or of the Jews and Gentiles both, but Israel properly descended out of Jacob's loins. The same judgment is to be made of their returning to their land and ancient seats, the conquest of their foes. The glorious church they shall erect in the land itself of Judah. These and such like are not allegories set forth in terrene similitudes or deliverance through Christ, whereof those were types of figures, but meant really and literally the Jews. So in other words, he's saying the church, which is all the believers in Jesus Christ that have ever lived, um, has not replaced the literal nation of Israel. God's original promises to Abraham's seed still stand. Um, because God doesn't say, well, I did make that promise, but now I've ch changed the terms and it doesn't stand anymore. God's promises stand forever. So, although people cannot be saved by being a Jew, or being Jewish, or simply by being descended from Abraham, God's promise promises to those people still stand. I know Jesus said, he, you know, that he could make sons of Abraham even from the stones. Um, so, 
and the, the arguments you had with the Pharisees were around the fact that they believed their salvation came from the fact that they were natural descendants of Abraham, which Jesus said, no, the, the real descendants of Abraham is through faith. So we understand that. But at the same time, God's promises to the Jews and the people of Israel do still stand. Many other books on prophetic matters were published. And in fact, the Dutch theologian Hugo Grotius, who lived between 1583 and 1645, stated that 80 books concerned with the millennium had been published in England by the middle of the 17th century. Many Puritans believed that the political and religious upheavals England was experiencing in the 17th century would open up the way for the Kingdom of Christ. The Puritan preacher John Owen had a great influence on Oliver Cromwell and Parliament and Parliament both before and after the execution of Charles I in 1649. He saw the massive changes brought about by Cromwell as part of God's work. He exhorted Parliament, the army and all of England to persevere in their political and military programme until we who were not a people at all may be a people to the praise of the God of all, that you who rule over men may be just, that we who are under rule may sit under our vines and fig trees, labouring to carry on the kingdom of the Prince of Peace. So Owen was of Welsh descent, although born in England. He pleaded with Parliament for the religious needs of Wales and Ireland as well as England, and also accompanied Cromwell on his Scottish campaign. So this just helps to illustrate how the spread of the Bible had ignited religious debate throughout the British Isles. The idea of England and later Britain having a purpose in God's prophetic plan was firmly planted in a nation. Throughout the 18th century, the continual state of war with France and Spain led many Protestants to see Britain as the bulwark against the Papist Antichrist. However, in the 19th century, the rise of Napoleon seemed to confirm Britain's position as the last bastion of freedom. George Stanley Faber, 1773-1854, was an Anglican theologian who wrote many theological works, many concerned with Bible prophecy, pictured Napoleon as the Antichrist at the head of a revived Roman Empire. He also identified Britain's great maritime power as being the ships of Tarshish, uh, referred to in Isaiah chapter 60 verse 9. In 1855, a Scottish preacher named John Cumming published two books on Bible prophecy. Cumming was a well-known figure in his day and was particularly known for his interest in eschatology or the end times. In one of the books, entitled The End, he identifies the nations of the Great Gog Alliance in Ezekiel 38 and names Russia and Germany as being chief among them. He also identifies the leader of the resistance to this confederacy, the merchants of Tarshish, as England. So the idea of England or Great Britain as Tarshish was now established and from this came the idea of the young lines of Ezekiel 38 being the colonies that sprang from Britain and this idea continued on into the 20th century as the nations of the British Empire developed. In 1920, Reginald T. Nash published a book called The Midnight Hour and After in which he specifically identified the colonies of Great Britain as the young lions of Ezekiel. The idea seems to become embedded somehow in national consciousness as many cartoons and posters depicted British colonies as young lions. In the 20th century, the ties between Great Britain and the USA became strengthened following the alliances of the First and Second World Wars. An article by Lewis S. Bowman was published in the Sunday School Times in 1942, where he depicted Great Britain's former colonies of Australia, Canada, New Zealand and America as being the young cubs or young lions of Ezekiel. 
The idea of Britain as Tarshish and her colonies as the young lions of Tarshish is therefore not a new one. Each individual young lion nation has its own destiny and will continue into the millennial period. This is something that I want to examine in the next series of videos if God gives me the time to make them. Thank you for listening. If you found this video interesting, you can find more information at prophecy-workshop.com.